Okay, so uh, this lecture will be time to switch to a different language. So uh, we will now go to the language Fortran. So I will give a so this will be two parts. So it will be another um, lecture as well, where we go in more detail on how to manage your Fortran project, integrate with Python and so on. So this will be a basic introduction to the Fortran language. So I will start with, with some history. So Fortran history. Fortran is a really old language. It has been around since the 50s. Uh, first version was uh, in 1954. And it has been a long tradition to develop this through standards. So uh, this list here, as I've shown the screen, is, is the standards that have been released for the Fortran language. Fortran F was a, not a standard, but an extension uh, of Fortran 90 that provided, removed some of the old features to kind of create a modern language. And then we have for 90, 90, 95, 2003, 2008, 2018. So the language is uh, developing things. The Fortran has a strong tradition of being backwards compat compatible. The ma major changes was done in Fortran 90, where some of the features for really old Fortran was removed. Then there has also been, uh, in um, some later versions of Fortran, they also removed old stuff. But basically, you can we compile your own all Fortran code using a modern uh, Fortran language as well. So I just want to set into perspective here uh, another language called Pascal. So I will show some source code for for uh, this program here: uh, multiple loops, functions, uh, data declarations, uh, and if in different versions of, of Fortran. Uh, so, so just to kind of be able to compare how the modern Fortran looks like in, uh, as well. So this is Pascal, not, not so very used language anymore, but has been taught a lot on, at universities. This is the same language in C. Here you have uh, the curly brackets instead of begin and end, but basically very similar to Pascal as well. And then we go back in time and go to Fortran Zero. So this is the same program written in Fortran Zero. And you can see here that you have line numbers to the left. There is a structured data format here. So uh, at this column here, you have line numbers, and then you have the code in certain, in, in, in certain columns here. Uh, the do loops is very different from today. So the, the numbers you see here is actually row numbers in your source code where the loop should start. Uh, where the loop should kind of uh, go and then where it should terminate. But then you have a loop variable. The really significant part that Fortran provided was a way for researchers to actually write expressions, uh, not in machine language, but actually in, in, um, in the way you do math expressions. So this was the kind of the revolutionary part of, of the Fortran Zero, because the developers of Fortran did, wanted to get away from writing machine code for where every computer they got, because at the time, every computer you know, that was developed had a different architecture. So they always had to rewrite their, their uh, computational codes in machine code, and that is very cumbersome. So Fortran was the first step to, to, to be able to write architecture independent computational codes. So if we so very much uh, focused on row numbers, there is also a go to statement here. The stop statement terminates uh, execution. Portal run, we got uh, more features. We could define my, your own uh, mathematical functions. Uh, you could define arrays. You could define uh, text formatting, for example. Um, the do, do statements were a bit uh, simplified, so only one row number was needed to be specified now. Uh, you've got string handling as well. You can print strings. Um, 
And the real revolution, so if we continue here, so the real revolution was, um, oh, and this must be okay. First step to the revolution, 424. Um, you got if statements here, uh, continue statement for the do statements here. Uh, and then in 466, uh, not so much here, but I think the big revolution was in when we got Fortran 77. This was the first really standardized Fortran. Also added the if else statements here, um, more powerful formatting and write statements. Um, we can define functions with code here as well. Uh, this is still used today. I mean, some, many old codes use Fortran 77, and it's it's very easy to take old Fortran code and combine it with Fortran 90, Fortran 2008, and, and, and on. So it's still possible to really easily link them together, compile them. A uh, certain source code are Fortran 77, other source code are Fortran 90. And there was a really big step up uh, with the, the Fortran 1995 standard. And the big change here is that you can't see any line numbers anymore. So this looks very much like a modern computer language. Uh, you have program here to start uh, your main program, and you have end program here to end your program. Uh, you have possibility to have subroutines in, in, in line with your code here. Um, also, loops and stuff are not, um, you don't have to specify any line numbers for those either. Um, it's possible to have array syntax as well to, for example, create a two dimensional array and assign it to a single line. So, a lot of array syntax was added to, to the language. Also, special functions like um, selected read kind for specifying uh, the, the floating point precision, for example. So you can you can in an in architecture in the uh, neutral way define what the precision of your floating point numbers. So this here, I will go through that later. But this enables you to do that. Before you had to specify either double precision or single precision, and the data types were dependent on the architecture it was running on. So you can also see the similarities here to, for example, Pascal uh, in, its, in its structure here. So source for, as I said, Fortran was a, it's a really old language with a lot of um, in heritage in, in, the back, uh, in the background. So I have a question here also. Uh, why everything in older Fortran was uppercase. Um, the reason for that was actually that the computers at the time couldn't, um, the, the, ask, the, the character set was limited to 127 characters. Uh, so there was no lowercase. And, and that, 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 that it was uh, seven bit ASCII it was called. So you, you could only have uppercase. And, and then uh, when Fortran 90 came, um, they changed that so you can actually have more characters. You can uppercase and lowercase. So the source form. There are two major versions of, of source code that you can write. Uh, free form or fixed form. And fixed form is the inheritance from, from the older Fortran standards. So that was basically from the time when you have punch cards. And punch cards required you to have a very structured way of writing your every line was a punch card and you have to specify at certain columns there were certain parts of the code. So for example, uh, source code was in position 7 to 72, line numbers were in position 2 to 5, and then you can have comments in the in column position 1. Uh, and a character in the position 6 uh, in, in your code was a continuation of, of to the next line. Uh, fortunately, we will not use the fixed form in this course, so we will go use the free form that was introduced in 490. Uh, and the source code format is, is the yeah, maximum of 132 characters per line. Uh, this is a standard uh, specification. So 
most compilers will support more than 132 characters. But if you want to write source compliant Fortran code, you need to kind of limit yourself to 132 characters per line. You can also have uh, comments anywhere on a line. You can also have uh, comments uh, after a statement. You can continue to the next. If you have a long line, uh, statement line, you can continue using the and character here to continue to the next line. It's also possible to have multiple statements per line. So you can, you can have multiple statements by separating them with a semicolon. So not to be confused with a semicolon you have in C++ or in C, where the semicolon will terminate to the next line and the next statement. So the, you, by default, you can always have a single statement per line. If you need multiple, you just separate them with a semicolon. This is an example here. Uh, you have, a, uh, this is a free form source code. Here you have, you can continue with the and sign here to the next line. Same thing here. I have two statements here, a write statement here, semicolon and a next write statement. The stop statement here is actually, uh, you know, that, that terminates the program unconditionally. So if you have a subroutine you call and you call stop, the program will, will terminate regardless where it is in, in, in the code. The only re required statement in the Fortran code is actually the end statement. All, most of other things are optional. So the smallest program you can write in Fortran is end. The program structure. Um, so the Fortran program consists of many source code files. And usually you have a, a main program that defines the main execution of your code. And that is structured in the following way. So you have a state, uh, in, you start your main program, you specifying the program keyword, then you can have, give it a name. Then you have specification statements and you have executable statements. This is different from C and C++ and Python. So in, in Fortran, you always have to declare your variables first and then you uh, have your executable statements. So every, always variable declarations first, executable statements after that. The program can also have uh, a contain section where you can put your subroutines in. So you have a contains keyword, and then you, you have your subroutines, and then you, you end your program uh, main program with end, and then optionally you can have program program name to uh, set the, the name of the program. It's always a good idea to, to use all of these because the code becomes much more readable than just specifying end here. So how do we run Fortran code. And with, if you compare it to Python, where you can always run your code, you just press play and it starts, it interpre interprets line by line. Fortran is a compiled language. That means it, it translates your source code into machine code and links that together to an executable, which you can execute without having the source code. So it will be a pure machine code that is for your, the processor that you're running on. So what is a program? So the program is usually executable code. It's also called machine code. And that is a small uh, numeric uh, code that is stored in memory, which has some meaning to the processor. So a certain number could be, for example, uh, read from memory location. And, and so basically executable code is a, a chunk of uh, bytes that define your program and every, every byte has a meaning uh, for the processor. So the processor will read the program directly. There is no translation. It will just go through these um, codes and execute them. Uh, the program also, your executable, will also need to have links to system libraries for interacting with operating systems. So for your program, for example, to be able to write to the screen or to the terminal, it needs uh, libraries to, to handle that interface between your code and the operating system. Uh, and also, you probably also need uh, links to external libraries for solving linear equation systems or uh, any numerical issues that or in numeric problem you need. You need probably a library to help your code to do that. So how, how do you create the program then? So you can, of course, uh, hand code, machine code, for example. 
which is really complicated and really hard, especially modern processes today have a lot of instructions. And to be able to use them efficiently, you really need to know how to align these instructions correctly for the code to be able to execute in a, in a, in a good way. Uh, the next step up to write a program is writing something called assembler, which is uh, text files where you, you provide the instructions to the CPU in, a, um, in readable small commands. So that there are kind of uh, mnemonics is called. Um, so you can, instead of knowing the actual byte of the instruction that you send to the processor, you specify uh, load, for example, or uh, store as a command, and then you have some codes to that. They're still machine dependent, um, but then you compile this assembler source code to machine code. So this is still very hard. It's less hard than writing hand code in machine code. The next step is using a compiler, for example. So as far Fortran is a, for, a compiled language, uh, the compiler is a special program that reads your source code and produces uh, machine code. And, and uh, the final program you have doesn't require a source code anymore. Uh, it's a standalone executable that you can run uh, on any computer with the same architecture. And a step up is using Python. Then you go one step up and it compiles and executes each line and it's more interactive than Fortran. So Python will, will require some kind of source code when running your code. There is an intermediate step in Python uh, called bytecode, but it still will require your source code to be able to run. So how to make it executable. So you have to write source code, of course. Then you have to compile your source code to object files. And object files are unla unlinked machine code. So basically, a machine code that has hooks to where you should plug in links to external libraries or runtime libraries. And the final step is to link these object files together to form an executable. That is, resolve the libraries that, that your code requires and create a standalone package or executable which you can run on the system. So the process can be simplified in this way. So for example, you have your source code files here named F19. And this <clears throat> object, these source code files need to be compiled. And then the compiler will create a .o file or an object file from each of the source code files. So you will get a directory full of .o files. Uh, and then also you have to specify for the, the, the linker then, the libraries that you require. So this first step uh, is the compiler. The next step, uh, when you have all these files, you, you need a tool called linker that will take all these object files and create the final executable that is standalone and you can run on your computer. So I will show how this is done on, our, uh, on Aurora, which is our HPC system. So we have a very nice, desktop environments where you can log in remotely to actually build and run your code in different ways. So I will try to show how this can be done in Aurora. So I have open Aurora here and I have a terminal here. Uh, and I will create a simple Fortran code here. So win my IT. And I need to create the main program here. So I do program. Uh, my fort. Then I will do uh, write. Oops, I can write. And program my. Now it's it's a bit confused with the uh, syntax highlight here. Well, it should now it's correct. So I have a source code file here, and <clears throat> so now I have to create, uh, compile this uh, to a uh, object file, and then I uh, call the Fortran compiler G Fortran, and then there is if you just want to compile a file and not link it together to create an object file, you can specify the C flag, then my my fort f ninety. To load a Fortran compiler as well. Now 
Now you can see I have two files here, uh, one myfort uh, and myfort.f90. And then I can, uh, let's see here. Um, then I need to create a binary file from this. So then you can, then you have to do, uh, Wrong button. Let's see it like this. G fort run um, my fort dot o minus o my fort. So then it tells the compiler to create and execute both from an object file, uh, output an executable called, called my fort. And if we look at the directory again, you can see now I have an executable called my fort. An object file O, oh, which I don't need anymore. So now my, my executable is, you can run it directly. So I'll do my fork here. And you see it executes and writes out the code. So this is why, but the photo compiler actually is much smarter than, so don't, you actually don't have to do all these steps. It's also possible to, for example, if I remove the, I can also do directly here, e fort run my fort 90 minus o my fort. And it will actually compile link and in, in a single step. So if, if you look here again, I have a my fort executable now again, and I didn't have to link here. So this is the way you can uh, uh, compile Fortran code if you have a, a G Fortran compiler. So now we are running this on, on our on our main HPC resource at Lunark. Um, let's see here. And what you can do here, this is not updated here. It, you can do ML to, to get the Fortran compiler, you can do ML FOSS and then 2021A. So it's the year. And then you will get the required tools to, to be able to build your code. <clears throat> to summarize, you can compile any source code file using the C command, command that will generate an object file. Uh, but you can also um, compile a link in single go. Uh, using .f90 and then specify .o and executable. And that will do it in one go. And you can also possible to specify multiple um, source code files at the same time. So in this case here, uh, my source, source one, source two, output, it will compile and link together all those source code files in one go. So uh, now we go through the more the, the different parts of the language as well. So we start with variables. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it it creates uh, an object uh, an object file for all those uh, base codes. Uh, in the previous uh, slide, you you show. Uh, in, in, in this, when using this, uh, by specifying the source codes files directly. Yeah. They, but when, when we have like several source codes, it will, it will produce the object files, but they, they will not be available for you. So they will kind of, it will do everything in one single go. Uh, uh -huh. if, if you do with minus C, it will generate the O files. Uh, and, and then you need to, to take the O files to combine them together. And that we, I, will, I will show you that later when we do make files, when we have more complicated projects, yeah. then it can be useful to compile, just do the compile only, not the link. Yeah. But for simpler programs, uh, it's much easier just to give the source code files minus O for the name of the executable. So it creates an executable file for all these source codes, right? And then we need to run that. Yeah, you can run that. And if you don't specify the O, uh, that will still work, but the execute will be, will be named a dot out. Uh -huh. So uh, that will also work. I, I usually have the 
Um, I always put the O because I want to name my file something logical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So variables. Uh, in, in Fortran, you have to declare all your variables. So in, in Python, you, you you declare you, you create your variables the same way you, at the same time when you assign them. In Fortran, you, you create your declare your variables and then you assign them. And naming your variables, you can have one to thirty-one alphanumeric characters. Um, you can have letters, numbers, and underscore. Uh, variables can can be uh, consist of both uppercase and lowercase uh, characters. However, Fortran is case insensitive. That means that um, it doesn't matter if you have uppercase or lowercase a, both will be the same variable, uh, which is different from Python where you can have uh, small, uh, lowercase a is, is not the same as same variable as uppercase a. So just remember, this is an uh, inheritance from old Fortran. So uh, that's why we, we, we uh, the naming is in, in uh, case insensitive. Also, first character can also not be a number. So valid names are a, a underscore thing, x1, mass, q1 to 3, time of flight. Invalid variables are 1a, a thing, because there is a space. One starts with a number. Uh, and you can't, you can't have a non-alpha variable can't consist of just a non-alpha character. So it has to be a letter and a non-alpha character. Uh, you have variable types, so you have um, integers, uh, real, that is floating point numbers, complex, comp complex number, logical for Boolean variables, character and string characters. So these are the, the, the most primitive data types. Then you can combine them to, to the more uh, complex data type by combining them together. You can also specify uh, the precision of each of these data types. So real can be both single precision, double precision, or any precision that you give it. So you can specify that as an option when you declare your variables. Variable declaration looks something like this. You specify your data type. You can specify some additional attributes. For example, if they is constant, you can specify that as a specific attribute here before. And then you have a double colon here, and then you have a list of your variables. So type, double colon, that is kind of standard way of doing it. And it looks something like this. So you have integer colon colon A that declares an integer variable, uh, real colon colon B, that's a floating point value, logical, Boolean variable. You can specify arrays directly by specifying real, the data type, D, and then this, the size here. So this will be a one-dimensional vector of 10 elements. And then you can have a two-dimensional array as well with real and then k 20 by 20. Uh, you can also specify the dimensions using uh, attribute. So for example, if you want to declare multiple um, uh, variables of a, with 10 elements, you don't have to specify 10 every time you declare. You can specify comma dimension and then C, D, E, F, and G, so to speak. Uh, character that is a, a data type for storing alphanumeric characters, a single character. Uh, you can have an array of characters, which is not the same as a string. So a string is a data type you, you declare a character and then len equals 80. This is a string of 80 characters. Character len 80, line 60, this is an array of strings. So uh, sometimes it's a bit confusing that you can declare character array, but you can't handle a character array in the same way as you do with a string in Fortran. So that's, uh, strings are defined by character and then uh, the length here in the parentheses. Constants, uh, these are not variables in the sense because if those are uh, named uh, constant values that are constant during the execution of code, they can't be changed. So you can use them as kind of read only, but you can't change them during the execution of your code. In this case here, I have an integer parameter A that can be used to declare uh, the size of an array here in your code. But it will be fixed when you compile your code. You can't change it afterwards. 
precision. So precision can be specified uh, as an extra parameter for the data type. Usually when you specify a data type, it Fortran will, will uh, always select the data type that has the least number of bytes. So this is also an heritage from old Fortran where memory was expensive. So they try to avoid um, uh, variables should be stored with as, least, at least, so as little memory as possible. Uh, also, the precision specifiers are dependent on the compiler and the system architecture, uh, which is some, some, sometimes really confusing. Uh, but it could be that you have, a, at least it was for 30, 40 years ago, when, when you have had a supercomputing, the floating point, um, uh, floating point part of that CPU was not always, um, they could be different from different machines. And, and the precision attribute reflected a system precision. Uh, and that has been inherited. So even today, it's uh, important that you specify this precision correctly. So for 490, they actually added two directives that you can use, selected real-time and selected in-kind, where you give the precision you want um, in, a, in a mathematical sense, and then it will return um, a value that you can use for declaring other variables. So this is the eight here, this is the precision specifier. So this is a real eight of A. So that is a, on an Intel x86 platform, the A tier stands for the number of bytes that, that the floating point consists of, but it's not guaranteed to be that. Real for that is a single precision. So a floating point um, that is stored with four bytes. So how do we use this selected real kind of? So then you declare a constant here, so integer parameter. This constant will be set during compile time. And you use this directive, you select real kind to specify that I want a, a exp exponent of 1500 and an exponent range of 300. And then you declare, use, use this real, and you specify the precision here with this constant. So instead of specifying eight to four, you use a, a constant when you declare your variables. So this is how this can look as well. So, um, so this is uh, 15 is a significant decimal that you want and the 300 in this exponential range that you want to specify. Uh, another important thing is that uh, when you assign scalar values, you need to specify the precision when you assign a scalar value as well, because otherwise Fortran does was always does try to minimize, minimize the amount of memory to use for storing scalars. So we're not specifying this RK here, which is the, I should be RK here as well. So this is a specifier here. If, if you leave that out, it will store 6.2 with the, the least number of bytes that it can, which will be single precision. So you can actually get precision loss when storing scalar constants in your code. So that's important to note. And I have an example here that I will uh, show here. Uh, I will run, run it in a, development environment here as well, variables. Okay, I'm going to find this here. Um, okay, I, I will do it manually. Uh, so this is an example here. Uh, we have a program called Constance. Uh, we want to declare the pi as a constant here, or use pi as a scalar in, in your code. So I declared an AP here, so that is the precision constant. I declared two variables here, one with the same precision, AP, P1 and pi2. And I declare pi1 equals to 3.14159, an old decimal say 
have here, but I don't specify the precision specifier. So I just leave that out. And then I do pi2 and then add my proficient, you know, this the precision suffix here. Uh, and then I just print them out, both of them. And you can see here, the output of this code here, the first one here prints the uh, pi here up until something like, um, it stops the precision here at some somewhere here, 192, and then seven, it just kind of loses precision here. While this, the second one here, uh, preserves the position here. Five, five, three, five, eight, nine, seven, nine. You know? Yeah. Just a question. Like, so how is it losing preci precision if you like define it in the code? Like, where does it get the other numbers from? Yes. Yeah, so so, so the, the thing is that the first number, the pi one here. So both of variables have the same precision. They can. They are eight, probably eight byte floating point values. Okay. Problem comes from the storage of the, the scalar constant here. So this constant here, without the precision specifier here, that will be stored in a single precision floating point because Fortran yeah, does this by default. It tries to minimize the amount of memory required to store this variable here. Okay, so it's just like um, choosing random numbers to finish it. No, way. It's just that it can't. So if you, if you have a single precision floating point, it can't represent more than uh, uh, the significant uh, decimals here. It, it can't represent that number uh, correctly because then there is no there is not enough precision in in the in the. So why so why is it not blank then? <laughs> like I'm sorry, like I think it's because I don't get this at all. So why if the precision ends after six? Why is it not just empty after six? It, it tries its best to represent it in, 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 in yeah, that is defined in the, how floating points are handled. Okay, okay. So, so it's, it, it represents as, as good as it can uh, when okay. it prints it out again. So um, mm. just that you have to think about that, that this, this value here in your source code, that will be translated to a memory location in your code. Mm. And this memory location for this value is only four bytes. And this is uh, eight bytes. Mm. So you, it can't kind of represent a floating point value with this many decimals. Mm. Uh, and, and then it just kind of prints out the best way it can represent itself. Um, and that's why it loses precision of the half. And that is typical when you have single precision that uh, the precision loses uh, uh, it's lost after this number of after half of the decimals, approximately. Mm. Okay. I and, this, and, it, and this is not the uh, way it works in Python, for example. <laughs> and it, it's mm. also not the way it works in C++. So this is a very specific thing for Fortran, uh, that you need, really need to think about how you store your scalar constants in your code. Um, that is also, you, and you can also do it when you compile your Fortran code, you can set a compiler flag that forces every scalar constant to be at a certain precision. Uh, so many, many Fortran codes use that kind of just to don't have to specify the precision for the scalar constant, this part here. Okay. But it's a bit risky because if you then send your code to somebody and they recompile your code, forgetting that compiler flag, you will probably have problems numerically later on. Okay, thank you for clarifying this. I, I think I will need to read more about this memory things. Yeah. Just, just remember that it's not the variable, the, the, these two variables are both eight bytes. So they, they are um, eight byte floating points, uh, these two here. And this one here is stored as a, four byte floating point. And when you assign them here, uh, it will assign a eight, eight byte floating point with the, um, the, the approximation of, of, a, of a single precision here. So uh, there will be a translation here. So things will be lost here. Uh, so it's just important that you always try to use the same precision here when you assign your scalar values in your code. I, 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 I always bring up this because this is always, uh, you always say, see bugs in, in Fortran codes that 
is just like this, that you have a scalar constant that is, looks fine, but it's actually not fine because it's really just half of the decimal uh, values. Okay. Uh, another thing that is inherited on the, from old Fortran standards is uh, the general type rule. So by default in Fortran, you actually just don't have to declare variables. So uh, by default, so variable startings with i going to n are always integer. Other variables are real by default. Uh, and this is uh, can lead to very difficult bugs and you should always try to avoid not declaring variables. And what you can do in 4090 is that you can place a specific directive that's called implicit none. And you place that in the beginning of your code and that for, uh, makes sure that the compiler will uh, check, require you to declare every variable in your code. Um, yeah, so that should, that should be in, just in the beginning of your code, either in a subroutine or a module or everything. Uh, always write implicit none because that will force a compiler to check your code, check your, make sure that you have declared a variable. Because otherwise, uh, if you're if you're uh, trusting a value, uh, for example, a variable n to be a floating point, if you don't have this implicit none, it will be an integer, and uh, you will have problems when you, when you translate from floating point to integer and, and vice versa. Also, you will be uh, implicit none will be well, the type rule will also say that it will be single precision real. So that's why it's good to have implicit none to force you to write, declare all your variables. Variable assignments is very similar to Python. You have a, a equals two and then a number and you, your precision specifier. Uh, please note that these are just examples here. So you have to declare these constants yourself and put them in as a specifier in your code. Uh, logical, uh, there is a special uh, value you can assign for false, that is called dot false, dot and dot true, dot true for true. Uh, strings are assigned either by uh, single quotes or double quotes. You can use the same thing as in Python, you can have double quotes and a single quote in your string or a single quote and a double quote inside your string. However, string handling in Fortran is, is not, uh, you shouldn't rely on that. So sometimes it's better to perhaps do your string processing in other language, for example, in Python, and then call your Fortran code for the computational parts because strings are not the easiest way, easiest things to handle in Fortran. Uh, defined and undefined variables. So uh, a variable is, is said to be undefined until it has been assigned a value. So if you declare, uh, for example, speed variable uh, in the declaration, the variable speed exists and it actually points to memory location, but its its value is always undefined. Uh, usually it just points to somewhere in, in memory without an, a, um, and, and, and the value of that will just be the value that is in that memory location. And you should never use variables that have, been, have not been assigned or, or are undefined. Uh, and then when you assign a variable, uh, the variable is said to be defined. So if you do speed equals to 42, that variable is now defined and you can use that uh, in other, other parts of your code in expressions. There is no explicit check for this. So a, a program can be perfectly valid uh, without an assignment and under, with undefined variables. But you should know that you can get really strange errors if you if you run your code and you haven't um, assigned your variables to value. Also an array is said to be defined when all elements have been assigned values in that uh, array. So if you only assign one value in your array, that is still undefined. Uh, I think we take a 10 minute break and uh, come back here at 10 post two. And I will continue with derived data types.
So derived data types. So in, in addition to the normal data types in Fortran, it's also possible to create uh, der derived data type or a compound data types that consists of multiple data types in a single group. Um, and sometimes it can be useful to, to, to uh, define your own. Uh, for example, if you have a particle system or something, you perhaps want to create a particle that has some properties, uh, X and Y, Z coordinates, and additional mass, for example. Um, and in Fortran, a derived data type can contain normal variable types, arrays, and other derived data types. So you can have a linked list consisting of uh, references to other derived data types. We define a data to, a drive data type by using the type statement, uh, specifying type, and then you define your own data type and then a variable. So this is an example of a drive data type. It's called particle. You have x by z and the mass, and you call this the data type a particle. And now particle can be used like any other uh, Python data type. So that would be kind of be uh, a new data type. And then you can declare a, a particle. And you have to use the type again here and the name of the data type and then the variable name here. And then you use uh, to access the different attributes of, of the data, the derived data type, you can specify, uh, you use the percent operator to um, access them. Uh, this is similar to the dot notation in Python. So the uh, percent is similar to dot. Uh, I really don't know why they used percentage here in Fortran. It's a bit unknown for me, but that's the way it is. Uh, so you can assign them just like normal variables, and you can also read them out uh, using p percent x, p percent y, for example. Uh, here's also a data type that is mixed of different data types in a single derived data record, and then you can assign this one here and you can just like and I just like the similar previous example here. Operators and expressions very similar to Python here you have a power to operator you have a multiplication operator division addition subtraction and the order of operations is uh, oh, sorry wrong. is uh, first the parentheses uh, power uh, operations with a uh, raised by operator, multiplication division, plus or minus. There are also relational operators. And there are two versions of them. There is a new one, so it's or very similar to the Python ones, less than, less than or equal, greater than, greater than equal, and equal to. You have double equal sign, this is also similar to Python. Uh, here is a bit one a bit different from Python. So not equal is slash equal. In Python, that is exclamation mark equal. Then you also have the older styles here. When when you only had 128 bit characters, you you could only um, uh, you could you couldn't use these special characters. So they used dot lt dot dot le or less than or equal, greater than, greater than equal, equal and not equal. So you, can, you will probably see these in, in older codes. Logical operators are always with a dot form here. So dot and dot, and dot or dot, 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 dot. <laughs> um, um, integer expressions, so uh, results of divisions. So if you have data types, it will, always, it will keep the data type unless you have a real, for example. So if you are um, uh, integer divisions, uh, it will be truncated towards zero. So six by three will be two, eight by three will also be two, uh, eight by three will be minus two. Uh, however, uh, doing um, two raised to three, that is eight, of course, but if you do two upper uh, to minus three, that is the same thing as one divided by to the race and, and an integer division here will be zero. So if you want to do this kind of operation, you should use floating point and not integers to do this. Uh, and if you mix data types in your expressions, uh, the weaker data types uh, in, in the expression, for example, uh, integer is weaker than a float uh, and 
uh, Fortran will always try to, it will convert the integer to a floating point, and the result will also be a floating point. In this case here, you have uh, A, I, and B. And if you multiply A and I, A is a real and I is an integer, B will also be a, a real data type. So then it will convert I here to a, a real data type before the multiplication. Another very nice feature in, in Fortran uh, 90 and above is uh, array expressions. So the built-in operations can be, can be applied automatic to arrays. Uh, by default, if you're going to do operations between arrays, uh, it's assumed that uh, the, the arrays must be the same shapes. So in, in Python, you, in, in NumPy, you, you could do um, operations on arrays that had, uh, did not have the same shapes. Uh, this is not possible in, in Fortran. Uh, you can also combine a mix, for example, uh, an array and add a scalar to an array and, and the scalar variable will then be broadcast to the entire array, uh, just like you know, we did with NumPy. Uh, the order of array operation is however not defined in the standard, so um, you shouldn't rely on the order of operations when you're doing this operation. And, and that is because they, um, certain compilers will try to parallelize these um, in efficient ways. So, so some example of this. So here I have declared two two-dimensional arrays, A and B, 10 by 20. I have a vector here, five, or it's a vector of the, with five elements. So if I do the first expression here, A divided by B, that is similar to an operation dividing every element A comma I J divided by B I comma J. So if you have this kind of uh, expressions, you don't have to do any loop. It will automatically do these operations uh, directly. Uh, v here plus one, that will actually add uh, one to all the elements in the vector V. Uh, in this case, here we have five divided by V. So we will first compute uh, five divided by all the rest. This will be also be an array. And it will add um, elements one to five, comma five here together and return uh, a vector of five elements. It's also possible to, to test for equality. So if you do A dot equals to B, that is true if all the elements are uh, equal in both A and B. So this, this is, is a nice feature that was introduced with 4.19 and up above. So it's kind of really powerful. Arrays and matrices. Uh, so arrays is uh, matrices are very important concepts in scientific and technical applications. So, and it's an extremely efficient data type at Fortran. This is a built-in data type. Uh, so you don't have to have any external libraries to, to do arrays, it's built in. Um, and you can both have static arrays or allo dynamically allocated. And we'll come back to that later on. The, the, the arrays I have been showing you now are statically defined array that basically you set the size at runtime and they will stay the same size during the run of your code. Uh, and they support, as I said before, uh, advanced indexing and slicing, uh, uh, very similar to MATLAB and NumPy. Uh, array indexes always start with one, which is something to remember because you're in NumPy, they start with zero. But in, in Fortran, you can always reassign uh, indexing. So this is an example here. Um, I have an index here that I want to define from minus three to three, and then this array will be defined here. So the indexes of this array is like this. So if you want to access the first value, you have to specify minus three, and the last value will be three. I don't see, I haven't seen this very much in code, but uh, it can be a useful tool sometimes if you want to communicate with C++ or C code, for example, that are always zero based. Assignment, uh, individual elements of an array is assigned by specifying K and then parentheses and then row and column, and then assigning a value. 
if you don't specify the index here, you can still assign an entire array by using k equals to five. That will assign every value in the array, to, to assign the array the value five in, in all elements. Uh, you can also assign multiple values in a single line. So uh, here we have a vector of five elements, and then I can assign this vector here by specifying parentheses slash, and then you just list the values here, and then you end with slash and parentheses, and that that will assign all the values in in V to these values we specify here. It's very similar to when you create an array in, in MATLAB, but you, you use uh, brackets to start the array and brackets to end. Here you have a bit more cumbersome syntax, but it's still possible to do that in one go. And this is this format can also be useful to assign individual rows or columns in, in two-dimensional arrays, for example. Uh, you can also assign individual columns or rows. Uh, and this operation is called slicing. And here you use the colon notation. So in this case here, uh, row two uh, will be assigned a value. Uh, sorry, sorry. B will be assigned uh, row number two, all columns. So this will be row number two. And then the values in B will be the values in row number two. And you have C here, all rows and column one will be assigned to the C uh, vector. Uh, Jonas? Yeah. Uh, what would happen if the size uh, set in the first, uh, when you, you set the the variable was different, and you try to do this. For, if you, for example, have a B3 or something, or... A, yes, yes. There is no checking here. And this is the dangerous thing with being really fast, at the, is that you can also crash. <laughs> OK. So it, uh, if you assign or do indexing, uh, and uh, the sizes are wrong, you can have the, the possibilities that you overwrite things in your own code or memory. Uh, or you access memory outside your program's memory area and, and the program will crash. Um, so it's always important that you have the indexing right. Okay, okay, nice. So in, in, in NumPy, you get these automatic checks, but in, in Fortran, it's a bit running without seat belts <laughs> at a certain extent. Um, so you have to think about this a bit. Uh, you can also do combine these two. So you can have, for example, um, in this case, uh, row number five and all the columns here will be assigned uh, the, uh, this um, one, two, three, four, and five in one go. Uh, and then you can do the same thing here with the vectors. Uh, another thing that is important to kind of, I think I talked a bit about it when we did the Python lecture here, how, how arrays are stored in memory. So generally you can say that arrays are always stored in one dimensional memory. So they have a starting address in memory and have an ending address in memory. The, the rows are basically jumps in this array, uh, but it's always stored in one contiguous linear fashion. Uh, and in Fortran, two dimensional arrays are stored column wise in memory. And this is different from Python where we store row wise. And I will illustrate this with an example here. So uh, when, when you declare an uh, array with 16 elements, that's no problem. They are stored just element one and then linearly in memory. If you declare uh, an array that has the same number of elements, but has, now has eight rows and two columns, uh, it's stored in memory in this way. So the first, first is the first column here. That's why it's called column-wise. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is the first column. Then you go to the next column, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So the numbers here are the, the number in memory. And if you do two by eight, they are also stored column-wise. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And in Python, it's the opposite around. So then it's stored one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So they are stored row-wise. Row 
But this, the common theme is that they're always stored linearly in memory. Like consecutive segments of values. This is also for efficiency reasons because uh, allocating small chunks of memory uh, in your computer is very inefficient for your processor because the processor does a lot of smart things to kind of, if, if it's, you access things in array, it assumes that you want more elements and you kind of preload things into memory. Uh, but if you if you have a completely random way of storing things in memory, the processor always have to go out to big to the to the large memory, and this is costly operation. So uh, it's, a, it's very important that you, if you have a large data set that they are continuously stored in memory. Yes, I think I did that already. Um, you can also uh, actually create arrays of derived data type. So in this case here, I, this is a data record and I can actually create a data record and I specify number five here. And that is actually a, an array that consists of five uh, data records. So you can actually, you can allocate arrays and they can consist of derived data types as well. We also have to take decisions in the code. So we need some conditional statements. And the basic ones are the if statements. And it's very similar to Python again here. Uh, the simplest form is uh, if parentheses, you, you will require parentheses of all if statements. So if scalar expression, then if it's true, it will execute this statement here. Then you can have if scalar expression. So an expression here, then execute this block. And then you can nest them as well. So like, like in Python, if then execute this block. If this is true, execute this block. Otherwise, execute this block. And you group them using the else and if, end if statements like this. One way, so this way. If statements. Here is an example here. So if x is greater than 1,000, uh, set this. Let's then do this, and then you have a nested if here as well. Here you also see the implicit none. So this will require me to declare the variables. So if, if I don't declare X in the flag, the compiler will complain and say that these are undeclared variables. If I remove this implicit none, it's not required to declare this at all. They, they, so, they will, so X will, in this case, be a floating point. Uh, L will be uh, that will be an integer, which makes this code probably not work as we expected either. There is also a select statement, which is for those coming from C. There is this switch statement in, in C. This is very similar. So if you have very many conditions you want to test for, this is a more efficient way of doing it. So you have a select case and with an expression, and if that expression evaluates to this selector here it will execute this block. And you can list as many of these uh, case blocks as well, and it will continue the code until the next case statement. And they can, you can also have something called case default, which is uh, if none of the above uh, uh, conditions uh, apply, it will go to the default block here. So there's an example here. We have a value we want to test for, and then we can test for different conditions here. You can test for ranges here, greater than one, uh, one, between two and nine, 10, uh, and so on. And then if, uh, if nothing is, um, none of these are true, <coughs> it will execute this one here. Then we also have some uh, ways of repeating code or repetitive statements. Uh, the first one is the do statement, which is similar to the for loop in Python, uh, but a bit more primitive. In, in, in Fortran, we always have to do index-based looping. So we loop over an index and then we use the index to access variables or arrays. So you have do and the loop variable, and then it's starting value and end value. And then it loops. You can also have a third parameter here, which is a step. Then it will step over the, the 
uh, loop over i using that step size. Um, and also, one important thing to note is that you are not allowed to modify the loop variable inside the loop. So that is um, uh, not defined in the standard what happens. So that is, you should be careful about doing that. Uh, you can also control the do statements uh, in different ways. Uh, it's very similar to what you do in Python. So for example, if you do exit, it will go uh, exit the do statement and continue after the loop. So in this case, it will go to the end of, after the end do statement here and continue execution. There's also the cycle, which will go to the next iteration. So it will kind of go back here, increase the loop variable and continue here. So exit will go out of the loop, cycle will go to the next iteration. I think one should be a bit sparingly, sparingly use this because the code can look kind of spaghetti-like if you have too many X and cycle. So you have to really think about what really happens now and if, I, uh, if the code exits or cycles. So yeah, it will print out this. Do while is a special form of uh, do loop which has a condition. And it will only it will continue continue executing the block if the expression is true. Uh, so this can be something if we do iterative calculation, you can iterate until a certain error is, error uh, value is, is uh, less than something. So for example, here x is zero, and then I loop until x is um, less than, if x is less than 1.05, I will continue executing this one. So I will compute the value of sin x, and then I will just increase the loop variable and then loop around again uh, until x is um, greater than 1.05. Built-in function. So there is a, Fortran has a, a relatively large runtime library, mostly focused around um, computation uh, and stuff like that. So it's not as extensive as Python, but uh, however, there, are, there are a lot of functions here. So mathematical functions, of course, the normal math functions here. Um, this A times two is, I think, is very, very good, uh, which is not always available. Uh, and most of these functions also work on arrays. So you can, if you have an array, you can you can uh, compute the value of all the, of, for example, sign of all the values in an array, which is very can be very useful sometimes. There is also conversion function, so absolute value a, truncates a floating point value to an, um, yeah. And then you can convert to integer, you can convert to a nearest integer, convert any values to a real, uh, compute the maximum of a set of values. There's also uh, vector and matrix functions, uh, not too many. So you can do a dot product, so the scalar product of U of B, matmul, matrix multiplication. Uh, and here you have to make sure that the, the both of these variables that you are multiplying have the same shape. And also the return value uh, needs to be the correct shape. So you have to kind of use your linear algebra to make sure that uh, the, the value you assign from the mathematical function is the correct size. There's also a transpose C transpose function that returns the transpose of a, of a matrix. Uh, yeah, here you can see also this example I showed you that you can have arrays here and you can do uh, operations here. So A divided by B, that will execute AIJ divided by, so element wise division. If you do square root A, C will be the square root of all the values in A. So this is really nice. So to illustrate um, a little bit how to use the matrix functions in in, uh, in Fortran, I will do a more concrete example of, of how you can use this. So going back to my mechanical examples again, very simple uh, stiffness matrix uh, for a bar. 
uh, and the stiffness matrix is computed by computing G transpose K, uh, local element matrix divided, multiplied by J. So J here is computed like this. KL is computed like this. We have some uh, scalar uh, factors here that you want to use in the expression here. We also compute like this. So what we do first is we uh, always implicit none. Then we create our uh, precision uh, constant here, which we use for all of our declarations. Uh, we real RK, then we have the values here, X, Y, X, one, two, three, four, one, one two, three, and then Y, one, two, three. Oh, yes, no, X, Y, Z. Then I have my NX, NY, and NZ. I have my length, my elastic modules area. I declare my local stiffness matrix here, two by two, and I have my global stiffness matrix six by six, and my J here. And then I just initialize all my scalar values like this. I compute L, I compute NX, NY, and Z, and then I want to create my array of matrices now. So in this case, I, K, E, L, uh, the first row is one and minus one. Row two is minus and one. And then I multiply K, E, L equals to K, E, L times this expression here. I compute my row one of row J like this, J two like this, and I do my uh, matrix operation here. So this is not as nice as doing, for example, NumPy expressions, but it's kind of, you don't have to do any looping. So the first thing I do, I calculate the transpose, multiply that with KEL. The result is multiplied by J here in the outer matrix multiplication. And then I just print out the results here. And that gives me the final global you know, stiffness matrix like this. So this is how I, I usually do this. Uh, I compute my constants here, and then I, I do very similar to what I do in MATLAB. I, I assign row by row to kind of give you this. So to when you read the code, you can almost see the matrices. Same thing here with J, N, X, N, X, N, Y, and Z. If you go back to here, you can see that this is very similar in the structure. This is also similar. So another important thing similar to Python is to be able to divide up your, your program into to, uh, more manageable chunks. Uh, and you can do that in uh, different ways. Uh, the, the, the most obvious way is to kind of create subroutines and functions. Uh, I'll get into this. So we'll get back to our main program here. We have the program statements. Uh, you can in the contain section have subroutines. And uh, of course you can have everything in a single source code file, but that is kind of becomes quite uh, cumbersome. So you need to, you, have, you should try to uh, divide up it in, in multiple subroutines that is in separate uh, functions, place them in modules, just same thing that we did, you did in, uh, in Python. Uh, the end statement thing is end of the program and terminus program execution. And the, you can only have one main program in the Fortran code. So there's always one source code file in your program that can have the program contains an end program. So you can't have multiple source code files, combine them together, then you get a linker error because you can't link them together because the compiler said, okay, you have two main programs. So only one source code file contains the main program. The stop statement is, uh, I covered a bit in the beginning here, but the stop statement will stop execution in all program units. Um, and you should perhaps, instead of stopping in separate subroutines, you should probably have an error statement or error value to return back from your functions and then terminate the code in a single position. Uh, so stop statement can also contain, uh, it can provide numbers here to return certain codes when you're stopping your code. And I think it's a bad coding practice to have a lot of stop codes in subroutines and functions because if you call a library, for example, uh, and you don't expect it to have a stop statement, it can kind of um, 
complicate your own code. Yeah, if you think that you call this and expect result, and instead of result, you your entire code stops. So the main part of uh, modularizing is is creating subroutines. Um, there are multiple ways of, of creating subroutines in Fortran. You can have external subroutines. Those are placed in separate source code files. They have an implicit interface. And then it can also actually be implemented in, in other languages. So when you compile a subroutine externally, it will be an object file. And then, and then you, when you want to link together, you need to kind of specify the call exactly like this so that the linker can find it. It's, it's very, um, um, can be cumbersome, but this is the way that it was done uh, before Fortran 90. You can have internal subroutines, that is subroutines that contain with the program units or module, module uh, units. So in the contain section, that is an internal subroutine. Then you can put your subroutines in module, which I think is a recommended way. Uh, and then you compile every module together and, and uh, uh, use that from the main program. So declare a subroutine, you call it subroutine, and then you give it name, and then you specify a dummy argument list is called, which is basically your parameter list uh, of the, in, the variables coming into, uh, that, that is uh, supplied in the call. Same thing here, you declare all your dummy arguments, uh, the data types of those, then you have your executable code. Return will return for a subroutine, go back to the calling, program and then end subroutine uh, you can have an option here name as well i usually both specify both the name here and also name at the end excuse me yeah and so subroutine is uh, working as a function uh, right is or as a class variable it's more like a function right uh, the thing in, in python you have uh, there's no distinction between a function and a subroutine so in, in, in Python, you can always return a value from a, for, from a function and everything is a function. Uh, in Fortran, you, you distinguish between subroutines that don't return anything on the left side, so to speak, and functions that return a value on the left side. So like a normal mathematical function. Mm -hmm. uh, so subroutines, they, they can communicate through the argument list, but not you can't assign a variable call to a function. So, uh, I will also show you, you call a function subroutine using the call method. Uh, so, yeah. In, in Python, you only have one concept. If you don't return anything, you don't assign anything. So you, you can call a subroutine without catching the variables, so to speak. But in, in, in Fortran, there are two different things, but very similar. So if you want to assign, uh, I mean, what what uh, function calculates we should not do it uh, with the subroutine there is something else yes then you should okay. use the, actually it's called a function <laughs> uh -huh. okay so it's, uh, it's just that you have a subroutine and that is something that doesn't return anything from uh, that you can assign uh, you call it and you provide input parameters but uh, but, it, it, but the subroutine can can still uh, return things out through the parameters which is a bit different from python so um, but the, the difference is that you can directly assign something variable with a function in Fortran, which you can't do with a subroutine. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, I will show an example here. So a variable, uh, a subroutine, all variables passed to subroutine are passed by reference. This is also something that is different from other languages. Uh, so uh, in Python, when you, when you pass something, you, you usually pass by copy. Uh, even a list is, is by copy, but the reference in the list is by reference, but uh, values are passed by copy. In Fortran, uh, when you pass a variable uh, and modify that variable in the subroutine, it's also modified in the calling uh, outside the subroutine. Uh, so the arguments actually refer to the actual variables in the calling code by default. Uh, subroutine argument that has to be declared in the subroutine. And you call the subroutine using the call statement. So this is the way you do it in the subroutine or in your in your code. And then when you want to go back to the uh, back from the subroutine, either you just let it continue to the end statement; it automatically goes back. If you want to premature return, you can use the return statement. Uh, 
you can have multiple return statements in a single subroutine. So, for example, if statements can return in different ways, and then you can have a return for every block in the if statement, for example. Uh, so this is subroutine here. Um, you have three parameters here, A, B, and C. You need to declare them here in your um, the first part of the subroutine declaration. So first integer A. Uh, I have a so B um, so B here is um, um, two dimensional array. Uh, you don't have to specify the second dimension if you don't want to because as it's, it's uh, stored by column, you can always access a certain number of uh, any column. Uh, so you don't have to specify that, but you need to specify. So in this case, I have a C array here that is the size of A. So A is an input variable that is given here in the call. And that also defines the size of the C here. Uh, and then you, you compute here. And, and also these these calling variable uh, list the calling list here these refer to the actual variables outside here, so modifying anything of these variables here will also modify them in the in, in the in the calling code. And then we have the, the functions and uh, has the following so you have the type here, so you can have for example double function and then uh, if for example. Um, and then you, to return the value, you do function name equals to return value. That will assign the return value, this one here. Otherwise, it's very similar to a subroutine. So it's a subroutine with the return value. So this is how it looks. So I have declared a function here that is floating point. It has it's the name, the name is f. And then it has one single parameter that is a floating point. And then I compute f here. And that will assign the return value here. So this is the return value because this is the name of the function. If you assign the name of the function, that will be a return value back. Otherwise, it's very it's identical. Do you have to declare all your variables? Um, you can use return as well. Then also, uh, when you have. So you can also collect subroutines and function in modules, which is similar to what you have in Python. And a module can contain global data, so you can declare variable constants in the module. You can declare derived data types and the definitions and the, the operations to those. Subprograms, interface blocks, name these definitions. Uh, so basically, a module should package everything of some that is associated with some kind of task. So for example, if you have a module that does integral into arithmetic, put all the functions and the data definitions in, the, in that single module. Or for me coming as from the structural mechanics background, I put all my finite elements of a certain type in a module so I can sort them out. A module is declared very similar to a program. So we call module, module name, you put your specification statements, and it contains, and then they put your module subprograms, and then you end module program name. So a very simple module that is very useful is to put all these precision specifier in a single module. So here I have a module called constants, and then I, I declare two constants here. Select the int kind here for a six, just a six uh, uh, precision specifier six here, and then I call this constant ik six. And then the same thing for my real kind definition, RK. And then in my code, I can use, use constants. Then these constants will be available to me to declare the variables. Then I can also, for example, if I want to change the precision later on, I can go into this constants module and change the parameter. And that will, every part of the program using constants will be updated. You can also actually declare variables in the module here. And you can also add an attribute called private or public. So you can declare variables that should only be available inside a module, that you don't want to be visible outside a module. So then you put private here. Then it's actually not possible for the, the program that used the module to actually access this variable. It's only the, the routines inside this module that can use this variable. But that could be interesting. It's a little, little bit about, uh, similar to the object orientation that you want to hide the internal workings of your, uh, your classes and objects. 
Same thing here, you can hide the internal workings of your modules. You can have private variables that are only used by the, the subroutines in this module. And then you use the module called use trust, and then the, the function or subroutine is available to, to meet the call here. If I don't use this, I, this will be a linker area, it can't hide this. So use here will make the functions available or subroutines in the trust module to my main program. Argument of subroutines, uh, parameters must be passed as reference. So I uh, said so changing a parameter in a subroutine affects the variable in the calling routine. And the reason why, why you have this by default is because this is actually uh, very fast. Uh, there is no copying. It's, you, you just pass references to other variables. Basically, you, you pass the memory address of a variable to the subroutine. Uh, and the subroutine works with that reference. But you should be aware of that many, especially older subroutines for older libraries, often use the variables that you provide to the subroutine as working working space for the computation. So I have several times when I've been using a subroutine library in Fortran, I pass my arrays in and then I try to use my arrays again, but they were full of kind of temporary variables. So it actually destroyed my array, uh, which I put in as input um, when I solved the equation system. So that is something to think about. So in, in those cases, you need to kind of copy the data uh, and provide a working array to the, to the subroutine. Also, the variable declarations in a subroutine doesn't have to be the same names that you call the subroutine with. So that the, the names in the subroutine is just the way of um, creating the, the algorithm in your subroutine and they don't need to know the variable names of the calling program. Uh, so now I have a, a subroutine here, uh, do work. And this is a, if you compare, compile this program and this one here, uh, you need to make sure that all of these parameters are passed along so that you can declare all these data here, all these the input parameters. Uh, which can be cumbersome. So for example, if you have an A array that you want to call, you need to pass the dimensions over to be able to do, do computation and you know the size the size that comes into the subroutine because the subroutine does, don't know anything about the variables in the calling program. That's why you need to kind of repeat the declaration here again. Uh, you don't actually need to specify the same dimensions here. As long as the number of elements are correct, this is completely okay to do. So here I have a A is four by four. In my subroutine, uh, it's, I, I interpret A as a, a dimension rows by column. So the number of elements are 16, but they are in a linear fashion. Um, and then I also have to pass the element sizes here. So I need to pass also a parameter over to be able to um, call the subroutine. Otherwise you will get, uh, uh, invalid access and you, you you can't link them together. So this is a bit complicated. This is the way uh, older 477 codes worked. Uh, you needed to pass all the required parameters to be able to declare uh, the input variables. So that's why you, in all the code you always have these long um, subroutine calls. So it is to be able to do work. I can't just pass A. I need to pass the size of A four by four. I need to pass B and I need to pass the size of B as well. Um, so it is complicated. So there are several flavors of uh, subroutine interfaces. The implicit one, it separately compiled F90 files and the compiler does not have any, all the information. That's why you have to provide all that extra information to be able to link them together. In 490 and above, uh, there is an explicit interface which um, if you use the modules, uh, you will automatically get a lot of more functionality in your interfaces. Um, you don't have to, for example, you can pass arrays without pass, um, passing the sizes of the arrays over as well. It's automatic. But that requires you to use modules. 
Uh, also, uh, if you use these kind of uh, ways of declaring, you can you can declare your arrays coming into subroutines without the, the actual sizes. So in this case, you replace the, uh, the shape size with colon, comma, colon, or colon. Um, and this interface gives the compiler all the information to determine the sizes of the parameters. And that will make a very much easier way of calling subroutines or parameter lists. And you can query the sizes of the incoming arrays using the size function. And I need to do an example here too. So this is the uh, way implicit interface, as I showed before. You have my uh, variable A array, and I need to pass over rows and columns here. Otherwise, this would not compile. Uh, of course, you can query here the sizes as well, because now they are kind of determined by the variables coming in. Uh, but if you instead of put the subroutine in the module, uh, you can do this instead. So you can do my sub A, and I can specify just that this is a two-dimensional array. I don't have to specify more than that. I can query the size here inside my program, inside my subroutine. Uh, as you see, I, I don't have to... Um, there is no incoming variables, but can still query the size. And I can call my subroutines much simpler. I just call my sub and then a single argument. And this requires that you use the utils, I'm oh, sorry, the module structure. So compiling a module will provide a compiler with much more inf information about the subroutines inside a module. It also enables you to uh, interface uh, the modules with the program in much nicer way than using the implicit interface uh, notation as in the old way of linking and separately compiling and linking uh, source code together. Uh, you can also do this in a, in a main program in the contain section. So if you put this uh, subroutine in the contain section, you can also use this notation here. So it, it's both for the main program contain section and the module contain section can use this. Uh, I think I'm uh, sorry for going over the time, but I'm almost, almost done here. Um, you can do this with a separately compiled as well, but then you need to declare the interface of the subroutine in your main program. So in this case, I have my subroutine here, A uh, looks like this with a colon comma colon. Then I do have to declare interface subroutine my sub 4a, and then it will be able to find this subroutine uh, as well. So I rather use modules than having to do this complicated way of declaring subroutines. I think I stop there and we continue uh, next lecture.